Hello, everyone. Hi, Grace Church. Today is one year since the big shutdown happened, and we went online and everything changed, and it is crazy what can happen in a year. And I wanted just to thank you for staying connected. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for participating in our online services. Um, and I have a favor to ask because I and our staff and our board, we, we love you, we care about you. And I would love for you, if you would, to email me. My email address is chris at gracechurchlaverne.org. And I just wanna know how you're doing, what you're feeling, um, what's happening, what, what God is doing in your life, if you're willing to you know, carve out a couple minutes, please, would you reach out to me and just let me know where you are and how you are? I would, I would really appreciate that. And uh, welcome back to another church service. Um, I have been in a lot of church services, and, and I remember when I was a kid, there, there were three things that preachers would say that would make my heart just drop to my toes. One of them was whenever the preacher would say, we've got a lot of ground to cover today. Um, whenever a pastor would say that, I would always think, oh no, this is gonna be a long sermon. Or they would say, I need to lay a foundation for where we're going today. I always hated that because I knew that it was going to be boring. Or, or sometimes they would say, and this would remind me of school, we're gonna have to put on our thinking caps today. And I always hated that because it meant the sermon was gonna be either complicated or confusing. And don't you hate listening to long, boring, complicated, confusing sermons? <laughs> I do. And I especially hate delivering those kinds of sermons. Um, but uh, I, I hope today is not long, boring, complicated, or confusing uh, because I, I do have a lot of ground to cover. And, and I am gonna have to set a foundation uh, for where we're going and, and we might need to put on our thinking caps in a couple of places. So wish me luck. I guess wish yourselves luck since you're listening and participating with me. And let's begin today in Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 1. Uh, today, I think, is the 10th installment of our series from the book of Colossians. And the theme of this message today is the new you. Colossians 3, verse 1 says, Since then... You have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When we spend a lot of weeks in one little book, and we just do a few verses at a time, sometimes we can forget the the big picture, or we need to be reminded of the big picture of what it is that, that the author is communicating. It's kind of like when you're putting a puzzle together and you know you put a few pieces together, then you always need to back up and, and look at the box again. What's that picture again that you're assembling? Um, well, uh, in, in Colossians 3 verse 3, uh, I think the Apostle Paul gives us the picture on the puzzle box when he says that you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That little verse gives us the, the, the picture on the box that Paul is assembling in the book of Colossians. And uh, let me give another metaphor to tie into this to help us really grasp what it is that Paul is teaching in this little uh, letter. Uh, do you remember how you felt when you first got your driver's license? I'm sure we have students at Grace that are you know, very close to getting their permit, or maybe they've gotten their license and they're, they're brand new to the side streets and the freeways. And um, by the way, uh, how do you feel when you approach a student driver on the freeway? Do you, do you give them a lot of room or, or do you try and encourage them or, or do you toy with them? <laughs> do you ever tailgate or, or whip around a student driver? It, it's, um, it's always kind of fun to remember how and and where we learn to drive. Um, I got my driver's license in a tiny little town called Newport, Washington. It's a little farming town, 3,000 people outside of Spokane, and that was stressful for me. I can't imagine getting my driver's license in Southern California. You know, our kids that grow up driving here will be able to drive anywhere. But when my girls were getting their licenses, I, I remember they both struggled with some of the roundabout on-ramps um, in our freeways. And I think we all hate those. It's, it's, it's not fun to 
slow down to 25 miles an hour and do the big long circle. But I noticed when they would approach these on-ramps, they would try really hard to stay in their lane. And so they would look to the outside to make sure they weren't drifting. But every time they would look to the outside, they would drift toward the outside. And then they would have to quickly correct and then they would overcorrect. And so they would go back and forth and it kind of felt like the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland. It was bumpy and back and forth. But over time, they learned that if they focused on the center line, the outer edge would take care of itself. And that is often true in life. Whenever we focus on priority matters, peripheral matters tend to work themselves out. You know, in a relationship, if you focus on love, I'm going to love this person in every setting and situation, the, the, the details will work themselves out. But conversely, sometimes if we fixate on the peripheral matters, if we focus on the details, but we miss the big picture, we'll drift. And then we'll have to overcorrect and we'll make some progress, but then we'll regress and we'll have to start over. Well, the book of Colossians is essentially Paul's argument that Jesus is the center around whom everything else revolves. In chapter 2, verse 9, Paul told us that Jesus is the embodiment of the Trinity. Jesus put a face on the mystery of divinity. And then in the very next verse, Paul says that you, me, we have been brought to fullness or we've been made complete in him. So Jesus is our center. When we focus on Jesus, other questions about life, relationships, concerns, they work themselves out. It's true in how we approach our lives. It's true in our relationships. And it's true in our theology. Sometimes in Bible study, people hold to what we call a bounded theology. There's something in, in Bible study called systematic theology. And that's where you take a, a, an idea or a concept and you study all of the places in the Bible where that thing shows up. And then you synthesize all of those references into a bounded teaching on that subject. For instance, um, this is what the Bible says about alcohol. You look up all the verses where alcohol shows up and you say, these are the references, these are the context, these are the implications. Therefore, we put it all together and, and these are our rules for alcohol. You can have this much, but not that much. It's okay here, but it's not okay there. Now, systematic theology is important because of course we need to know what the whole Bible teaches on a subject so we get the whole counsel of God. However, a simpler and healthier form of theology is not a bounded, you're in or you're out systematic theology, it's a centered theology that revolves around the person of Jesus. When, when he is our priority, when, when we look at his example, the way he lived, the way he loved God and people, when that's our ambition, that informs our consumption of or our abstinence from alcohol or, or whatever it is that we're discussing. Now, again, this doesn't mean I don't look at other verses. It means Jesus is the fullness. Of course, it matters what Moses taught about alcohol or how to treat a stranger. But Jesus is the center. He, he's the sun in our solar system, and we revolve around him. Uh, J Jesus is our hermeneutic. That means he's our interpretation key. Do you remember uh, movies or stories when you were a kid about treasure maps and hunting for treasure? Maps always have what we call a legend or a key. And you, you have this tool that helps you decipher what's on the map so you can find the treasure. Jesus is our legend. He's our, our key. He's the hermeneutic that makes sense of the rest of Scripture. And so what Paul teaches in Colossians is very simply that when we are properly aligned with Christ, everything else falls into place. That's the book of Colossians in a sentence. Um, verse 4 says that when Christ, who is your life, appears 
then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, now consider those words. When Christ, who is your life, appears. Uh, remember with me, and this might be thinking cap moment, remember with me that there is an upcoming appearing of Christ that is yet to happen inside human history. Uh, the scriptures, um, old and new, and specifically the new, clearly teaches that there is both a first and a second advent or coming or appearing of Jesus in human history. The first advent happened, of course, at the Christmas story. And in the first advent, Jesus injected cure into the world. He injected the cure into um, humanity. See, the world was damaged very early on by sin. And, 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 and by the way, the Bible's teaching on sin helps make so much sense uh, uh, about everything that happens around us and inside us on a daily basis. But the Bible teaches that the world was damaged by sin. And so for thousands of years, when God related with humans, he worked with them inside a broken system. And he did work with them. He created a nation out of all of the other nations that could show the world what it looked like to relate with God. He gave humans a law to follow. He gave prescriptions on how to worship. He, he instituted a temporary sacrificial system to try and deal with some of the death and trauma of sin. Um, he gave people leaders. He gave priests and prophets and judges to, to lead people. But all of that was temporary. All of that was inside a broken system. And when Jesus came the first time, he brought the cure to the system. He broke the chokehold of sin. He legally um, dealt with evil and strongholds and, and our brokenness and our issues. And Jesus made possible the inauguration of a new humanity. Not just religious people who are trying to be a little bit better through their religious practices, but Jesus made possible the emergence of a born-again tribe of Christians, little replicas of Jesus Christ that live in relationship with him and show the world what that looks like. That's what happened at his first advent. Um, at his second advent, Jesus will complete the cure. The world will be set right, and what began in Genesis will find its culmination in the book of Revelation. Now, sometimes when we preach Christianity, we miss this big picture. Um, tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Um, often when people cre uh, preach Christianity, it, it kind of sounds like this. We are jacked up, you know, thanks to Adam's original sin. And, and we don't even factor Adam out. I have jacked up my own life. We humans are messed up from sin. But thankfully, because of what Jesus did by stepping into humanity, dying on the cross, paying the price for our sins, we get to be forgiven. And we get to go to heaven when we die. And heaven is awesome, but, but it's also vague enough in scripture that, that it kind of slips to the back burner of our thinking and we kind of have this intellectual joy and hope for heaven and, and we try to, at varying levels, do better at being good Christians. And that's kind of how the story ends. And, and there's truth to the story, but it's not the whole story. It's like if I drew a picture of a, of a stick figure, if I drew a, a stick man, I could say, that's a human, and it, it is, kind of. It's, it's a one-dimensional sketch of a human, but a, a real, living, breathing human is so much more than a one-dimensional stick figure. Well, when we read the Genesis creation story alongside the Revelation culmination story, we see some amazing parallels and fulfillments. And I'll list um, several of them here on the screen you can glance at, and I'll just comment on a couple of them. In Genesis, God walks in the garden with Adam and Eve. In Revelation, John hears the voice saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with the people. 
In Genesis, we have one tree of life inside a garden. In Revelation, we have two trees of life inside a garden, inside a city. In Genesis, sin enters the world. In Revelation, sin is forever expunged from the world. In Genesis, Satan, suffering, sickness comes into the world. In Revelation, all of that is cured eternally. So the end of the story, it's not us floating around in some awesome heaven that we can't really imagine. It's the restoration of everything that God originally intended. It's a remade earth. At the end of Revelation, John John sees heaven and he says, it's a new heaven and a new earth. It's a remade earth and it's a remade earth where love has been chosen freely and thus becomes the characteristic of the people there. Uh, Sometimes people wonder, well, can I sin in heaven? Or what would, why wouldn't there be another fall or another great rebellion? And the reason, the, the answer is no, and the reason is that there won't be a possibility of sinning because the choice of love for God will have become the constitution of the people. People won't be robots that have no choice but to love. They will be freely loving people whose choice to love has become their nature. And constitutionally, it will be who they are and and what they are. Um, They will become their choice to love. Um, Evil will be judged. Every person will have had a chance to respond to the brilliance and the beauty and the glory of God. And what began in Genesis will continue outside of our time-space continuum. And we call that eternity. And that's what the scripture teaches. Well, back in our verse in Colossians now, it says, when Christ appears, second advent, you will appear with him in glory. So, So here's the message today. Not only is the creation moving toward a recreation and a perfecting, but so are you. Uh, The new earth will be better than Eden, and the new humanity centered on Jesus will be better than original humanity. That's where Christ is taking you. And then for just a few minutes, uh, follow me on this. It's very interesting that in the next verse, The Apostle Paul says that we have a role to play in that transformation. In verse 5, Paul says, therefore. So he connects everything that I've just shared with what he's about to say next. He says, therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of these things as well. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is neither Gentile nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, I like that imagery of verse 5 because Paul says to put to death the things that are bringing death to you. In the last couple of years at Grace, I've, I've intentionally belabored the idea that sin brings death. Sin does not make you bad, it makes you dead. Sin doesn't make us just a little less holy or a little more raw or a little less righteous. Sin brings death into our lives. And listen, this really doesn't need any explanation. Um, if If I lie to you, I kill your trust in me. If I assault you, my violence kills your sense of safety with me. If I cheat you or if I slander you, I kill your confidence in me. Now, fortunately and certainly, sin can be forgiven. 
And all of these things can be recovered and restored and rebuilt. But sin crucifies and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. If I reject you, I kill your confidence. If I break a significant enough law, I kill my freedom. I'm going to be arrested. And sin cuts both ways. Sin brings death into the heart and soul of the person sinned against. And it also brings a measure of death into the soul of the sinner. So I love how how in verse 5, Paul essentially says, put death to death. See, the Christian call to holiness is not a call to holier than thouness. It's not a call to legalistic self righteousness. It's a call to kill the things that are killing your soul. There are practices, and Paul listed them for us in Colossians, that will kill us if we indulge in them. God created us in a certain order, and when we function outside of his path for us, we invite a measure of death into our soul. I mean, human relationships are made to flourish on kindness and gentleness and tenderness and love. Well, when we inject harshness or, 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 or betrayal or meanness into the relationship, it, it releases a toxin and it chokes the life out of the relationship. And, and ultimately, it not only leaks death into the person or the relationship or the situation, but Verse 6 tells us that it actually invites the wrath of God. Verse 6 says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now, last Sunday, I, I, I reminded us that the wrath of God has less to do with God being ticked off and actively smiting or judging someone. And it has much more to do with God turning a person over to the consequences of their decisions. Um, and this is really pretty clear in Scripture. It shows up in lots of places. Um, you know, Romans 1 says, because of these things, the wrath of God is being revealed. And then it explains what that looks like. It looks like God turning people over to the fruit of their decisions. Uh, another example of this could be the hardening of Pharaoh's heart in the book of Exodus. Sometimes people really struggle with that because the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and then he judged Pharaoh for the hardness, and that doesn't seem fair. You know, 19 times in the Exodus story, it says that Pharaoh had a hard heart. 10 of the times, Pharaoh hardens his own heart, and then nine times, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. So it sounds like Pharaoh had a hard heart. And when God brought judgment against Pharaoh, God surrendered Pharaoh over to the hardness that was already happening into his heart. Um, in Psalm 7, verse 11, Scripture says that God is a righteous judge who displays his wrath every day. But then it says that if the sinner does not relent, God will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons. He makes ready his flaming arrows. So this is a good picture for understanding how God um, deals with us. If a person persists on a sinful path, God starts sharpening his sword. He doesn't start swinging, he starts sharpening. If the person refuses to come back to God, God will pull out the bow and say, hey, don't make me bend this thing. If they keep walking down that path, God's gonna say, hey, I have no choice but to string this bow. And if, if they keep going, he'll eventually have to put an arrow to the string. He, he pursues and he pleads and he convicts and he draws. Listen, no one is surprised by God's judgment. And we've got some high-profile stories. It seems like we always have high-profile stories of leaders who fall in a compromising way. And you know what? Those people are never surprised by judgment. Now, sin has an inherent deception to it. So people, people are surprised when they're exposed because they're deceived enough to think that they won't be exposed. But, but whenever you do an autopsy on a failure, when you evaluate it afterwards, people aren't shocked. No, nobody, nobody has judgment sprung on them. God's been calling. He's been sharpening the sword. He's been bending the bow. He's been calling them to come back from destruction. Does that, this make sense? Um, so uh, again, back to Paul and in, in conclusion. Paul, Paul says, let's 
Let's put to death the things that have the potential to destroy us. Um, when we see God bending the bow, we race back to him with all of our soul. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, I talked to you about the strenuous life. And, and I read the verse where Paul talked about um, how he combined his intense effort with God's dynamite power. And, and when we did our little Greek word study, we saw that God takes this dunamis, dynamite power, and he stacks it up in our life. And when God tries to, to excavate or break up a log jam or do a work in our life, we then join him in that work with, with the intensity of an Olympics gymnastics champion. That was the language that Paul used. So, so we, we've all failed. We've all sinned. We all have corners of our minds and our hearts and our thoughts that we don't want anyone to know about. But we never make peace with those things. Paul's telling us when God goes after something, we partner with him there. Sometimes the reason that we don't gain lasting victory in our life is not because the sin is too powerful for us. I realize that we can become bound up and we need help getting free. But sometimes it's not that sin is too strong for us. It's that we have never made a firm commitment by the strength and the grace and the power of God, I will put to death this thing that's threatening my life and my soul. Listen, God meets us in that place of firm decision. He helps us. So the first step, if you want a couple steps here on, uh, on doing this, is um, if we want to become the new you, the new me, make a decision. Uh, I will put to death all of the death that is threatening to, to rob me of my life in Christ. So make a decision. And then number two, um, in its place, make a swap. While I'm offloading XYZ, I'm going to be embracing ABC. Um, in verse 12, Paul said, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, now clothe yourself. So we've already offloaded these earthly works of the flesh. Now clothe yourself in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. So I renounce, I declare war on these things, and then I, um, I put on kindness, humility, all of these other things. And then verse 15 says, when I do, the peace, and that means the security, the composure, the rest of Christ fills my life. And that's where I want to live. Um, when he appears, I want to be like him. In fact, when he appears, I want him to have less work to do transforming me. I mean, did you ever like before and after photos? I want this to be my before and after photo. I, I want that level of transformation in my life. I want Jesus to appear and say to me, son, I see myself in you. Uh, last verse in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner or purifier of silver. And, and these, these smelters or these purifiers, what they would do is, we know that they would put precious metals in a crucible and turn up the heat. And as the, the metal would melt and change substance, impurities would come to the surface. But what they would do is they would scrape the impurities away and this purifier would know that the metal was ready when they could see their clear reflection in its surface. So when enough of the impurities are scooped away, that, that the, the artist's features could be seen in the metal, the metal was ready to be put on display. And that's what Jesus is doing in us. He's, he's shaping us and crafting us and transforming us so that when he appears, we will be like him in his appearing. So can we all just kind of take a deep breath today, and can we regroup, and can we recommit, and regardless of what last week looked like or last 
year or the last decade, can we regroup and can we recommit in this moment that we will win this war? I want to have total and complete and lasting freedom in every area of my life before I die. And if I don't reach it, I want to still be in the fight. I want to still be contending for that. Um, and as we contend, let me just end with this thought. Let me remind you of how God sees you. Paul said in that verse that you have been chosen, that you are holy, and you are dearly loved. So while you struggle, while you fight to put off and take on, God says that you've been chosen. That means you're wanted. That means you didn't come onto his team by default because you were the last kid left on the playground and you had no choice, so I guess I'll take you. No, he chose you when there were other options. Holy means that you're set apart for a purpose and dearly loved means that you are adored. You are his chosen, wanted, holy, adored child. And he's calling you into purpose and destiny and the person that you were originally designed and created to be. If you have never opened your heart to that message, would you do it today? If you've never had a marked moment where you say, Jesus, I give my life to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I believe that you are the son of God, that you died in my place and God raised you from the dead so that I could rise with you. I want you to forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make a fresh start in me. If you've never done it, I've just given you the language, do it now. And if you do, if something is stirring in your heart and you, and you wanna take that step, again, reach out to me, email me, contact our church. We would love to talk and pray. This is a glorious and difficult and amazing life following Jesus. Um, in Jesus, we come home. He's our center, he's our son. And so for all of us today, Lord Jesus, we just commit that we are all in, we are going all the way, we are not backing up, we are not relenting. When you appear, we want to appear with you in your glory. So help us, empower us, fill us, be with us. Bless our loved ones, transform our world, and use us in that act and moment. In Jesus Christ's name, amen, amen. Hey, I love you all. Again, reach out to me, contact me, let's stay close. Let's be prayerful and, and worshipful as we approach Holy Week here in a week or so. So um, I love you. God bless you. You're, just, you're dismissed. You can go.